Hey, what's up, Good Life? Thanks for joining me for today's 128 moment. Hopefully you were able to join us last Sunday as we, as we started our new series entitled The Gospel, His Passion, Our Purpose. And we dove back into the Gospel of John and we explored three groups and how they were responding to Jesus and to the good news of the Gospel that He was bringing. We looked at followers of Jesus, we looked at those who were just searching, and we looked at the opposition, those who were actively and bitterly opposing Jesus and the good news. But we confronted the possibility that somewhere deep down in our hearts, we might struggle to believe that some people, those people in the opposition, might be beyond the reach of the gospel. Now, we don't, we don't say it out loud, but by our attitudes and our actions, in particular our inactions, we sometimes reveal our true beliefs. But we concluded by remembering that everyone needs to hear the gospel every day. And to really reinforce that point and to call us to action, I want to tell you a story, a story about a man named Charles. Charles was born to a working class family in Boston in 1931. Uh, He overcame his humble upbringing, ended up receiving an Ivy League education, graduated from law school, I think in 1959. And his love of politics led him to be one of the youngest assistants on Capitol Hill, where he earned, where he kind of learned to navigate Washington's dark side. He ended up working for Richard Nixon's 1968 presidential campaign, and he ended up stepping aside in order to practice law. But he ended up coming back to be the White House special counsel, and he became known as Nixon's Mr. Fix-It. During that time, he started to embrace the darkest side of politics. He, he had like assaults on anti-war demonstrators. He plotted to firebomb a, a liberal institute, and he compiled what came to be known as Nixon's enemy list. When he was asked about his political passion, Charles once said, I would walk over my own grandmother if it was necessary. His role as a political hitman was was never more clear than when he was part of the cover-up of the Watergate scandal. His role in the cover-up led to his resignation in 73 and his indictment and imprisonment in 1974. The man who'd once pulled the levers of power in the White House found himself in an Alabama federal prison. Now, Charles's story would probably be a footnote in American political history, except for the intervention of a close friend. Uh, a, a close friend who gave Chuck Colson a copy of Mere Christianity. Reading through this book, he saw amazing things and got impressed on him that he needed Jesus. He obsessively studied the Bible during his time in prison. And when he was released, he published a memoir called Born Again. Nixon's hatchet man became a man surrendered to God's will. His prison experience, it gave him a burden to reach inmates with the freedom of the gospel, and the Lord used him to establish prison prison fellowship ministry where it's active in over 100 countries. Before his death in 2012, he'd published 30 best-selling books with over 5 million copies. In response to his conversion, one columnist said, if Chuck Colson can repent of his sins, then there's hope for everyone. Now that writer's cynical jab was beautifully true. No one is beyond the reach of the gospel. 35 years later, after his resignation, Chuck Colson stepped back into the Oval Office to receive the Presidential Citizens Medal from George W. Bush, where he celebrated that that Chuck Colson had brought God's message of boundless love to prisoners, former prisoners, and their family. Chuck Colson was a walking testimony that no one is beyond the reach of God's grace, that the good news of the gospel can change the heart of anyone. But if Chuck Colson is not enough, I want to invite you to consider the Apostle Paul. Paul was once the Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a hater and persecutor and likely murderer of the early church, early Christians would would hear his name and tremble at his name. And yet, when he was on the way to Damascus to capture more Christians, he met the risen Christ. And the sight of Jesus and the good news of the gospel changed the church's chief opponent into the greatest church planner the world has ever seen. How did Paul's life not only change course but stay on course? Well, in all those years to come, Paul never forgot that he needed to preach the gospel to himself Every day. Years later, as he wrote his first letter to his spiritual son Timothy, Paul wrote these words. He said, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of all. Paul was not remembering his past to fixate on his sin, but to remember that he needed a Savior, that he needed the good news, and we should do the same thing. 
So this week, as you go about your everyday life, go about it with the authenticity of someone who has been saved from their sins and with the boldness of someone who's carrying the good news of Jesus to the world that they desperately need to hear, that, that Christ came into the world to save sinners, sinners just like you and me. I hope that encourages you guys. I hope we're out there being a people who love enough to share the good news and living authentic lives that look like the love of Jesus. Hopefully you'll be able to join us on Sunday, 9.30 and 11, 11 o'clock online as we continue our series called The Gospel. And until then, let's go be a people who will love enough.